In Ireland, where a third of the population relies almost exclusively on the potato as its primary food, the famine will last seven years. Proportionately, this catastrophe kills one in eight of every person living on the island. Hello, my name is Colleen Parsons. I'm a member of the board of Solus Nua, and I'm an associate professor of English and director of global Irish studies at Georgetown University. I am delighted to be joined uh, by the director of this film, Ruan McGann, and by one of the experts from the film, Emily Mark Fitzgerald, for a conversation about the film itself, but also about how we think about and how we remember uh, the famine today. Let me introduce our two experts here. Emily Mark Fitzgerald is Associate Professor and Head of School at the School of Art, History and Cultural Policy at the University College Dublin. Her research concerns Irish art history, visual culture, museum and heritage studies, uh, and her book, her acclaimed book, Commemorating the Irish Famine, Memory and Monument, was published in 2013. She's a recipient of major fellowships uh, and research funding from the US-Ireland Alliance. She won a Mitchell Scholarship. Um, the Mellon Foundation, the Royal Academy, the Royal Hibernian Academy, uh, and much more. Ruan McGann is the director of this film. He's a producer, director, a writer, and a creator of documentary and drama. And his credits include the History Channel series, which many of you will know, The Men Who Built America, as well as numerous documentaries about the Irish Revolution and improbably, I think, a comedy series about the Easter 1916 Rising. His work has won Irish Film and Television Awards, a pre-Europa, he's been nominated for an Emmy, and has featured film festivals from Delhi to Milan. Emily, Ruan, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining us for this uh, post-film conversation. Uh, I wish, of course, we could do this in person. We would have a large audience who would have many, many questions. My job, in a sense, is to try and channel those questions. I don't know that I can do it that well. Um, but there's so much here. It's such a rich uh, film and obviously such a rich story that we've been sort of writing about and thinking about for now 175 years. We are 176 years since the onset of, um, of the potato blight in Europe uh, in 1845. Ruan, maybe I'll turn to you for a sort of a general warm up question and think about you know, why, why did now seem like the time to to make this film, make this film. What was the importance of doing this now, 175 years later? Well, I, I think you've already struck Colleen on that. For, for, first, I just want to say uh, thank you for inviting me. It's absolutely such an honor just to be here with you, and I'm so glad that everybody got to watch the film. Um, the, the first reason, obviously, is just to commemorate the 175th anniversary. Um, uh, it's it's uh, the last big RTE documentary. Well, actually, it was a BBC. It was, it was 1996 around. You know, again around the twenty fifth, uh, you know, the one hundred fiftieth anniversary. So RT felt it was time to go again. But as you say, there's been lots and lots of documentaries made about the famine, if the famine in the intervening years. So the question is, why now? Why do it again? Um, one of the reasons is that um, University College Cork, who are our partners in this, um, had produced an amazing book called The Atlas of the Ar of the Great Irish Famine, and in that there was a lot of new research. Um, uh, a, a lot of academic consideration of the issues surrounding the famine, um, its legacy, the causes that, that led to it. Um, and also this amazing way that they have of using maps to represent what happened. So you begin to see the famine on a very local and regional basis on, on a human scale in a way that hasn't been done before. Uh, e even, you know, I imagine many of the people watching this are are uh, in the United States and North America. So again, in the Atlas, they, they show where specific parts, people from par specific par parts of Ireland left to and where they settled. Um, so it's an amazing way of looking at the famine. So that was another reason and, and no one had ever looked at that Atlas and tried to turn it into a television series. Um, well, and then the, yeah, the, yeah, go ahead. The, the, the third reason, um, there's many, many scholars then, and a lot of them you've just seen in that, in, in the documentary, had done extraordinary research and work um, over the last decade, and a lot of it's still ongoing. So there'll be another documentary in another 10 years. Um, and, and it was just an opportunity maybe to, 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 to give a deeper um, understanding, perhaps, hopefully, uh, in, 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 into what went on back then. Um, I was struck, uh, Ruan, as I was watching and I was thinking about it, that um, you know, we, we know that we, we, we've, we've seen many films based on books or documentaries based on, on you know, particular kinds of evidence. Um, 
This is one based on an atlas, uh, a very visual, um, you know, very in, in, in a sense, you know, quite static. Even though even though maps can can move and offer us quite deep information, what was the challenge of sort of translating an atlas into a film? Well, it, okay. Well, there's, there's two ways to look at it. But first, uh, all of those, uh, many of the maps are showing the experience of real humans. They're 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 charting human lives. These are these are lives that have been accounted for in the census, often in 1843, I think. And, and, uh, and, and, and we can therefore see how, you know, how the impact on women, the impact on children, the impact on um, men and women, uh, different age groups, different social groups. So, 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 you know, don't be fooled by the word atlas. And then the other side of it is that an atlas also is based on a lot of maps and maps are about roads and, and through towns, through the countryside, through villages. So they bring you right to where people live. So again, maps are about people. Um, so although it appears to be an odd way to look at things, it forces us as filmmakers to take maybe a bird's eye view on the story. And that can be very, very useful, very helpful. And um, it's one of the reasons there's so many drone shots. I know drone shots are becoming a little bit of a cliche in documentary making these days, but in this particular instance, they make a lot of sense because we're following the, 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 the paths of the people. And, and in a sense, they give us a they give us a, a picture of what Kevin Whelan talks about the sort of the cultural history of the landscape in many ways. Um, I was struck, obviously, um, thinking about the Ordnance Survey. Um, I'm going to throw in my own work here. I'm very interested in the Ordnance Survey. I wrote a book about it, and I was struck by the way that this film offers us a really thick description of what seems like what can seem like quite spare maps. Um, and that seems to be what you're, what you're, what you're, um, what you're giving us there. Maybe I'll turn to em Emily actually um, for a second. Emily, your expertise is in visual culture, um, uh, and and you make and, and so we think about I think about the, the atlas as being a, a sort of the, the recreation of a visual culture of the famine, which it does. The the atlas of the Irish famine is an extraordinary uh, documentary body in a sense. But you make a fascinating claim in the film that the famine was one of the first visually mediated catastrophes. Um, and I was really struck by that. I thought maybe you might give us a, a couple of examples of how that kind of mediation worked. Like, why does it matter that this catastrophe was so visually mediated? Well, I suppose it was visually mediated and it wasn't. There's kind of two sides to that question. Um, on the one hand, the, what's really interesting about the famine is that it coincides with the explosion in illustrated news journalism in the 19th century. So one of the most important publications of the day is the Illustrated London News of the 19th century. That It's founded in 1842. So that's only three years before the onset of the blight. And so you have this kind of newly emergent mass media form, which is coming into being at the exact same time as the famine. And so for that reason, it becomes one of the primary ways in which the famine is actually visualized. Um, relatively speaking, there actually aren't a huge amount of paintings and other kinds of visual documents of the famine. And I know this is probably something that Ruin struggles in all, anyone who does a visual project with the famine struggles with because there isn't that really deep visual corpus of material in the way that you see for other kinds of experiences. There's a whole host of reasons for that. But uh, just to summarize, I suppose it's that one, the famine is not the type of experience that lends itself to much visual representation of the period. You know, academic painting, not interested. There's not an audience for this kind of work. And none of the conventions for showing the human body can accommodate the, the, the vision of a, of a starving body. Um, and even when you see illustrated journalism, it still is somewhat sanitized. Um, and it's always less gruesome than the text that accompanies it, for example. So there's all these limitations which occur in terms of um, the picturing of the famine in the 19th century. And yet, at the other, on the other hand, because this is such a massive crisis, it receives worldwide media attention. So it does appear, you know, in representation and in textual form. And then, of course, later on, it becomes extensively represented and mediated in novels and other kinds of things as well. So yes, it's kind of a mixed answer to that question of the representation uh, of the famine. But it means also that I think as a filmmaker, you often have to be quite creative with how you try and make this a visual experience. For folks. So I think many of you know, Ruin was talking about these kind of drone shots of the landscape that does start to give you a sense of the scale. And if you've been in Ireland or you've traveled in Ireland, you're very familiar with how marked the landscape still is from the famine, right? And that's quite an extraordinary thing that it is so visible within the landscape here. And I think the film really does an excellent job of sort of conveying that. Um, and especially by using the kind of, you know, uh, photographic technology that we have now, you can demonstrate that in a way that's extremely visceral. Yeah. 
I work in the field of 19th century literature. Um, and uh, and you know, if we think about representations of the famine, um, even in the work of somebody like James Clarence Mangan, who's writing as the famine is un unfolding and arguably becomes a victim of the famine, um, it is largely occluded. And it's not until later in the century, really, that we get to a sort of a, a, a more focused idea of a visualization in literature of, uh, of the famine itself. Um, you, you speak about one image in particular, the James Mahoney picture of the famine victim um, and the sort of you know, impact it had um, and how it was subsequently, how the famine was subsequently remembered. Um, do you want to maybe give us a sense of how that image traveled? Um, it's a very iconic, it's a very affecting image, but you, you have a, a really interesting reading of it. Sure. Um, just to say, on, on just on the, the first point, though, that, you know, there's a wonderful sort of team of researchers who are based at Radboud University, you know, who've been doing fantastic research into famine era literature, who've actually found a really extensive corpus of representations of the famine in 19th century literature, but it's within popular fiction, which tends to be, you know, not widely seen, even though it is wonderfully, um, I suppose, popular in its own day, but it's just kind of forgotten now. Um, but in terms of the image that you're referencing, you know, I think you're probably talking about the Bridget O'Donnell and children image, which just about any publication about the famine has, has this image in it. Um, and it's a, an image of a starving woman and her children. Uh, it it's corresponds with a news article where she's speaking firsthand of her experiences uh, in the Illustrated London News. And it's, a, it's an incredibly compelling image. Um, but what I've argued sort of elsewhere is, you know, one of the reasons why it's compelling, first is that it really centers on the body of a woman and children, which is a kind of a, a carrier for, for messages about the famine. And that's true very much even today when we see appeals for other kinds of crises all over the world, that these are often centered, you know, often problematically in the bodies of women and children. This is something Margaret Kelleher has explored in a great deal of nuance in her work. Um, at the same time though, that image of the starving woman and her child is actually quite exceptional for a lot of famine representation and just how stark it is. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of the illustrated newspaper coverage, you know, it can be even quite scenic and have picturesque details in it that sort of take away from the harrowing sense of, of the scene. But that image is, is so compelling. There's no background detail. You know, it's just her and her children there. And they're gazing at the viewer in a way, again, that the famine victim doesn't always look back. And for that reason, I think, you know, it is such a compelling image. And, and for the famine as well has become really, I suppose, iconic as an image of the, of the Irish famine. And so many, I've seen so many contemporary representations, later commemorations in the 1990s, which all adopt that same image. And so it's interesting as to why it, it continues to have that, that, that kind of currency. Yeah, it becomes sort of a transferable image. Yeah, Ruan, go ahead. Well, I, I, two, two, two things pop, pop into my mind. The first is we, we, we did, as you probably noticed, use a lot of photographs, but they're all, they all post-state the famine. Yeah. And we state that very clearly at the beginning. But had we not been able to do that, we'd have been in an off the place, you know. And and so now now previously a lot of those photographs have been thought to be famine photographs, but they absolutely aren't. Um, however, they do give you a glimpse into the the housing types, what people were wearing, even the faces. I mean, the poverty didn't go away after the famine. So, um, the, the 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 second thing is a story about Bridget O'Donnell. We we were she 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 comes from a place called Gertnaduha in County Clare. And of course, it's a parish that's gone. It doesn't exist anymore, kind of. I mean, you could just about find it on, if you really go very, very deep into modern current maps. Um, and so I went to that general area and I sort of found a, just, I, I often follow my nose, just whatever, I, whatever take, you know, we'd like those amazing snow shots in the burn. We were brought to them. I won't go into it, but it was an extraordinary experience. It wasn't snowing. We went up in the burn. Suddenly, it snowed, which is exactly what we needed. So this sometimes happened. There's a serendipity. So this, I, I stopped, started filming. This farmer came up to me, County Clare, thinking I'm in Bridget O'Donnell's locality, and a farmer comes and he says, "What are you doing?" I said, "Filming." You know, I, I think she. I know she didn't come from just about here, but she came from this general area. So I'm hoping you don't mind him taking a few shots. He said, "She doesn't come from here. She's she's from up the road." And in fact, if you go jump in your car now, I'll bring you there. But the one thing is don't speak to anyone when you're up there because they still know that they're related to her and the shame still exists. And we're 175 years later and they're known as the family of Bridget O'Donnell who let that happen to her and she isn't her name, you know, isn't, isn't, isn't her name known all over the world. Now, I won't tell you exactly where it is, but it's an extraordinary reminder of how powerful the story continues to be today. It, it hasn't gone away. The echoes are still there, very much felt in America, but still here in Ireland as well. 
Yeah, I would have found that extensively in my own research as well, you know, going around Ireland when I was researching kind of in the 2000s and having a look at what people had done in a commemorative sense, you know, was always very aware that there were local sensitivities that ran very deep in terms of even a transfer of land uh, that was still very much felt in, in local communities, or even, for example, you know, rival football teams being having nicknames like the Supers, Supers, you know, this kind of thing, which is a holdover from the famine period. Um, so it's, yeah, I think what Ruin's talking about is the fact that it's never, it's never really gone away and it's omnipresent in so many places in Ireland. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll um, switch to, to thinking about that idea of commemoration and, and remembrance. And Emily, you obviously wrote your, your uh, monograph ab about this. Um, uh, you know, you, you could say that the famine while it lived on in um, popular memory in the way that Ruan has has, uh, has suggested or has, has told us that the famine was um, somewhat neglected in historical scholarship um, until close to the 150th anniversary in the 1990s. Um, so 1995 became a huge year for uh, thinking about the, the legacy of the famine. Um, and you you wrote about that, so maybe you know give you a chance to talk about that, but also maybe think about what has changed in the twenty five years since there was a laser focus on the famine in the nineteen nineties, and it was during you know well you you can tell us about that that laser focus in the nineteen nineties. Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose it's it's maybe an overstatement to say it all kind of kicks off in the nineteen nineties, because of course, like oh, we course, have. Yeah. We have Cecil Woodham Smith, right? 1962, The Great Hunger, which is still, I think, the best-selling Irish history book of all time. Still, for a lot of people, it's their reference point um, for getting into the subject of the famine. And then you have folks like Jill Mock here and, and Cormac O'Grado, who are writing in the 1980s and doing some of the most foundational kind of economic history of the famine, James Donnelly as well. Um, but then, of course, in the 1990s, you know, you do get this sort of burst of, of scholarly activity, uh, which happens. So um, it's, on the one hand, you know, what I think is interesting about the famine's commemoration is that it's so much a grassroots phenomenon. And this is particularly true in the States. You know, you don't have these formal structures of commemoration, which are necessarily guiding activity. Um, but this is something that I very much found in my own research that it was really grassroots groups which were responding, I think, to this renewed interest that was happening in the 1990s for different reasons in different places, um, but really were shaping the famine in different ways um, based on local particulars, right? In Northern Ireland, you've got the backdrop of the Good Friday Agreement. In the United States, you have, you know, there's some unease around shifting demographics in Irish America that are happening in the 1990s. In Australia, you know, you have the um, the national apologies that are part of Australian culture at that time, and the famine connects to that. Um, so it's a really interesting kind of convergence of different forces that make sort of the famine memory something of interest to a lot of communities and all, uh, Irish diasporic communities in particular um, all over the world. I suppose since the 1990s, the big changes that we've seen in uh, from a scholarship point of view, there's certainly a lot more um, comparative studies of the famine. Again, kind of Cormac O'Grada pioneers this uh, in an early stage, but now we see a lot more comparative work being done on the famine, which I think the film really reflects very well. Um, and also an increased interest, I think, in its broader cultural history. So again, how it appears in representation, its legacy in terms of the sort of multi-generations of memory of famine that we see happening, not just in the 1990s, but in earlier periods as well from the 19th century and up to the centenary also. So yes, but the comparative thing, I think, especially in terms of um, a Ruins film, especially bringing in um, the what happened with the blight in Flanders, what happened in the Netherlands, you know, that also has been a really productive area of famine inquiry. And also, of course, comparing the Irish famine to other famines, the Finnish famine in the 1860s, um, the Great Leap Forward under Mao, uh, which is still probably the famine with the highest mortality in history ever, of which we know still very little. Um, and things, of course, like multiple Indian famines, the Madras famine, the Bengal famine, and these kinds of things, and Ukrainian Holodomor as well. What do you think we learn from these comparative frames? Like, what are the, what are, if we, if we, I mean, you know, we can't reduce it to one particular sort of, you know, happy, easy lesson, but what, what do you, how do you think that has expanded our understanding of the Irish famine by looking at the Finnish famine, the Bengal famine, all of these? And that can be a question for either of you, really. Emily, maybe, and then Ruan can pick up after that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what it, first of all, it shows us that famines are enor enormously complex social and economic experiences, and there's so many moving parts to a famine, and especially when they're durational in the way that the Irish famine is, you know, that it occurs for such a long period, and there's different phases as well that occur. And by looking at other famines, and by looking at how all these moving parts work together, it gives you a sort of a way, a mechanism of understanding, you know, the famine that you may perhaps be interested in. in my case, it's, it's the Irish famine, 
um, because there are things that you can sometimes think are particular to your particular national situation or you know the uh, structure the political structure of the period but then when you see it replicated elsewhere but for different reasons it helps you sort of rethink as well narratives that may have grown up over time in particular countries over over famines and really helps at, force you to really ask difficult questions sometimes um, because most the history of most famines have often initially been told from a national perspective but as we in famine scholarship I think have learned over the last 20 30 years that sort of broader comparative perspective brings in a great deal uh, more nuance and I was really happy to see that the documentary highlighted that yeah there's um it's a uh, I'd completely concur um with what Emily's saying there's there's a um, like famines are avoidable and I, 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 I'm not sure what I thought when I started this project I just got into it um, I was dealing you know technically how do we tell the story what is the story how deep do we get all these sort of I wasn't really thinking about the people and it took me quite a while to, to start seeing them um, because there's you know there's no photographs there's no images they didn't really speak we have that lovely song in the first 15 minutes which is written by somebody who dies in 1846 but it's hard to find their voice so it takes a while. They're, they're kind of they're kind of missing in the story, aren't they? The million who died, and um, but the thing that strikes you after you've been with that for over a year is it's it's avoidable. It didn't need to happen. And then you ask, what do, do we learn? I would say nothing, because we we have seen famine after famine after famine happen since, and nearly every one of them avoidable. There's always food somewhere. There's always the money very close at hand to buy that food and import it or, or take it from someone else and give it to those who need it most. Um, so there's always a way out of it. And for some reason, some part, I mean, it is very complex as Emily says, but, but some part of human nature denies those that don't have what they need. And, and that is the fundamental question of famines. Why do we deny others? And I think there's a lot of questions, Colleen, that our people in Ireland have to ask. I mean, obviously Britain, an awful lot of responsibility uh, rests on British policy during the famine, but but Irish people can also ask a lot, ask themselves a lot of questions. Those who survived, um, because you didn't survive without stepping over the bodies of someone who was dead. You didn't survive without holding on to stuff for yourself while others starved. You know, there's no doubt about that, and and you know perhaps some of that shame that people have always spoken of the great silence after the famine was as much because people felt embarrassed about what, what they hadn't done. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I think there's a lot of lessons, but I just don't understand why we, you know, there's famines going on right now in, in the world and, 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 you know, we could all be doing something to, to, to stop them, but we're, maybe we're not doing enough. Yeah, I mean, that sense of survivorship and, and survivor guilt in the sense is what, uh, is what Brenda Maxivna talks about in the film, but also in his book, The, the End of Outrage, and, and the complexity of the interactions between Irish people at that, at that time. That leads me actually to something else I think that you, know, that, that you open the film with, and it's about the question that was asked at the time that we're asking now is that how could this have happened at the heart of one of the largest, one of the wealthiest empires at the time? And, in a sense, there's no way to answer that question, but it does lead us to a question about the sort of awkward or strange articulation of Ireland with empire in the 1840s. Like, how did it fit into the empire? How was it disarticulated with the empire? You know, how, what does the famine show us about the place of Ireland in the empire in the 19th century? Rowan, I think you, you, know, you the, the film brings brings this up. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm almost reluctant to get into it because. I, I don't want to bash the British and, and it's- Of course, yeah, yeah. And it, but it's also, it, I think it helps, I'm, I'm not gonna forgive them, but I think it helps to try and understand where they were coming from. And that maybe that's a better way to then decide whether to, or to what extent blame should be apportioned. Um, so you've got to imagine that they're the wealthiest empire probably that ever existed. I mean, we don't know, we can't go back to Rome and, and other great empires, but there's a sense that they have, they have immense power, they have immense wealth, and they are very concerned with sweating every single asset they have. And Ireland is a breadbasket and they need it. And, it, and, 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 and the, 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 the condition of, the, of, the, of those workers in Ireland who are producing the food doesn't really factor because generally the poor people at, in Victorian era were not, were a kind of expendable uh, resource. You know, so I, I, this one sense, maybe the Irish shouldn't take it so personally. Right? The British were like this everywhere with everyone, with their own poor, 
Um, and then, and then you also have a, a providentialism. This is a no. There is a, well, Malthus is quite convinced at the time, as are other uh, economists, that there are simply too many people living in Ireland for the amount of food that they can produce. Um, it'd be grand if they're all doing you know well, but they're all kind of there's a, there's a half of them are at the very very bottom. So there's a problem in Ireland that needs to be addressed, and. Cormac O'Grada has suggested, well, maybe if there'd just been, you know, organized emigration for them, that would have solved one way to solve it. But some people in Britain are thinking maybe we'd be just better off if they, if they were allowed to disappear, right? So, I mean, it's very callous, but, but, but it, it, it fits with a particular way of thinking that, that was prevalent at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, and then you have a neoliberal perspective, which is just gaining ground which suggests that everyone should stand for themselves. And if you can't stand up for your own self, then that's your problem. You know, so it's not somebody else's job to be taking care of you. So, so you, you, you have this sort of clash of, of very unfortunate ideals and agendas, and the Irish are sort of drowning in it. Um, it's, it's, it's just a useful way to look at it. We, we just weren't very high up on the agenda. We were an irritation. Um, I mean, it's a shocking. It's Sorry. also, you know, and I think as what Ruan's saying, and he pointed sort of earlier, it's also to think of there's no, there's no distinctive we, you know, when we're talking about this either. I mean, class plays a huge role in effects of the famine. Not all parts of the country suffer the same way. You know, the Irish poor are seen as morally and socially inferior, economically inferior by British elites, but they're seen as inferior by many in Ireland as well. So, you know, who, who are the kind of winners and losers of the famine is a really difficult question uh, when you start to look at it. And that's what things like Brendan McSiven's book, you know, I think exposes, you know, those very difficult questions, what's referred to by Primo Levi as the gray zone, right, in terms of Holocaust studies um, and, and what happens in the kind of extreme conditions of famine. I mean, we're in this really interesting period right now, I think, within um, Irish history and Irish historical practice where this sort of the role of Ireland in empire is being examined. You know, this is part of this wider examination that's going on in British history as well, because Ireland occupies this dual role between, on the one hand, being colonized, but also part of a colonial enterprise in other parts of the world. Um, and, you know, you have Irish soldiers participating in colonialism elsewhere. So it again, it's not a black and white picture. Uh, and it's, it's a, it, it provides all these really difficult questions and historical grappling that we have to do to consider this dual role. Now, in terms of the famine itself, perhaps that's a little bit less, you know, gradated, but, uh, and I think what Ruins point to is it's really this convergence of ideologies in the 19th century that lead to this absolute uh, catastrophe and that I think most scholars of course would say of course this should not have happened in in the richest empire in the world at this time at this at this point in time but why did this happen and what is it that we can maybe think about uh, in terms of that that we can help us understand contemporary crises as well around the world yeah and actually I want to move to that because you know in many ways the film offers us a sort of a, a series of moral questions um, about history, but also about the present and the ending with the images of refugees and asylum seekers coming to Europe, the, you know, the, the you know, millions of people now in the world displaced, seeking a safe place to live uh, in the way that Irish people sought a safe place to live in the 1840s. I mean, one of the questions we could ask, and this is you know, not necessarily about Irish policy, although it is too, it's about European policy, is um, have we learned the lessons of the famine? If, if one of the lessons would be a sort of a sense of empathy and an understanding of um, the plight of people moving across the world in search of safety, um, we look now at the, at the, the what, what's called a migrant crisis, um, but that in itself is, a, is a, it's a really complicated and problematic language. If we look now at what's happening with, with massive migration and, and the numbers of refugees and asylum seekers, has the world learned? from famines, from large scale displacement, from, from these kind of hungers, or do we have a long way to go now? Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, the famine has been placed in this, con in this contemporary context since the 1980s. You know, it was Action from Ireland and Concern that were two of the organizations that first really um, sort of went down the path of trying to commemorate the famine in Ireland. And then Mary Robinson, you know, she's the president during the 1990s and human rights is really at the top of her agenda. And so you have all these parallels with African famine of the period that are made. And now, of course, then we see the famine being related to the Mediterranean migration crisis and, and whatnot. So I don't know, sometimes it can feel a bit circular, perhaps, is that it's constantly used as a reference point. But do we learn? Do we not learn? But um, again, I think having taking sort of an inward look, I think, has been very uh, useful uh, in terms of thinking about the famine. I do think in Ireland, oftentimes, the sort of call for empathy that's been driven by historical experience has been successful in many respects. We don't see the type 
and this is not to say there isn't xenophobia in Ireland because there definitely is, but we don't see the same extremes that you see playing out in Britain, for example. So it is interesting to kind of think about some of these differences, which we may say is in, in some cases aligned to historical empathy. I don't want to let Ireland off the hook though, because I think there's still really important questions to be asked about things like direct provision, um, about the institutional legacy of mother and baby homes of Magdalene laundries, you know, which are products of the Irish free state, which are also kind of forms of incarceration, which are descendants essentially of the workhouse. And many, many of them were actually, were actually in workhouses. Yeah. Physically within these are ex workhouses that become institutions, absolutely. Um, and that sort of trajectory and genealogy of institutional suffering, you know, is still, you know, a history that needs to be plotted in terms of those relationships between pre and post independence. Um, but in any case, these are these are still difficult questions that are not just about external experiences of famine, but about things that we are still doing here in Ireland today. Ron, um, maybe I'll give you, we, we've come up against time more or less, maybe I'll give you the last word and it's a difficult question. Uh, it, what do you hope the audience will come away with after having watched this film? What are the, what, what are the, you know, I mean, and that's a, that's a, that's a tough question, like what's a takeaway? We, that's not why we make films, but you know, what are the sort of abiding things that, that, you, that you think might stick in the audience's memory? Um, oh, well, I'll, uh, <laughs> I don't know, because every, every viewer is so different. Um, and so each, to each their own. I, I, think, I think without being flippant, perhaps more questions would be a good thing. It, it, was, it was a very, very complex situation. Um, uh, after it was aired in Ireland, I was struck by how many of the, there was a huge response on Twitter. I mean, I've, I don't think I've seen the like of it. Uh, it's very, very rare you'd see something like that. But a lot of people were taking a very straight down the line black and white uh, analysis that essentially the, the, the British had done us a great wrong. And, and, and yes, it's true, okay? You can't deny that. But um, there's an awful lot more going on and it, and it, and it really is a very multi-layered and complex situation. Um, so one would hope that people would, would look at this and, and be left with more questions. To, uh, to ask and and would be inclined to you know this is only a documentary really go in and have a look at all the, the amazing books that have been written lately you know to go and do some more research of your own um go in by the atlas i mean there's lots of different ways to explore it deeper the, the other thing is perhaps just to be reminded of how we feel the anger towards what happened to those people and 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 empathy towards the immigrants who had to leave and then and then maybe to, 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 to compare that to the threat we feel when we see immigrants today coming, wanting to share our resources and, and ask ourselves, how, how can we live with both of those feelings? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an incredibly complex uh, landscape. I love, the, I love the answer of, you know, what we should come away with is a sense that th in many ways, this is ungraspable. <laughs> Um, but it's, it, it, it is something that we need to continue working with and continue working on. I mean, uh, you know, Emily, as a historian, I'm sure you would say that, and it's true of every single um, sort of act of commemoration and remembrance and historical imagining. Um, I would love to spend more time talking with you. Uh, I'd love to, uh, love to have all of the experts from the film here with us in person, but uh, we've come up against um, uh, the time. We, we, we can't stay here forever. It has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, Emily Mark Fitzgerald from University College Dublin, Ruan McGann, director of the film, The Hunger. Thank you so much for joining us. We have so much more to talk about and so many more questions, um, but perhaps we'll do it another time. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.